Good morning, everybody. Jedediah the cat says, oh, goody, it's recording time again. I can start parading all over the place and going crazy. He always just gets so excited when, when we start getting setting up, start setting up for, for our recording. Uh, he thinks it's just perfect for playtime. But welcome to our service. And uh, as we worship together this morning, it's my prayer that we would draw close to Christ, that we would draw strength from Christ, that we would be comforted by Christ, and that we would know his love in this time. As we worship together, let's quieten our hearts. Let's prepare ourselves to be in God's presence. We're not just here to watch a program on TV. We're here to worship. And so let's quiet now, hearts. Our call to worship comes from Matthew chapter 4 and verse 4. Jesus answered, It is written, Human beings do not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Let's worship God together as we join together and in praise and adoration as we sing praise my soul the king of heaven to his feet thy tribute bring worship you this morning as Lord and Father of creation. You have made the towering mountains and the tiny insect, and in both we see your glory. Your love shines through the power of the sun, and your gentleness can be felt in the cool of a breeze. All creation sings your praise, and this morning we join in their song. You are an awesome God, and you love us very much. Thank you for sending Jesus and calling us together to celebrate his work. Please take away anything that hinders us from coming into your presence. Still our minds and open our hearts. Heavenly Father, your name is awesome. You are King of Kings and Lord of Lords. You are the most powerful, the most beautiful. And yet you love to hear us sing and pray. This morning we, we pray that you will delight in our worship and in our adoration. But dear Father, we bow our heads before you and confess it. We have too often forgotten that we are yours. Sometimes we carry on our lives as if there was no God and we fall short of being a credible witness to you. At this time, with all the uncertainty in the world, with all the fear for the future, we too often fall into worry and anxiety. We lose sight of all your daily blessings and of your constant presence. 
we lose sight of you. For these things we ask your forgiveness and we also ask for your strength. Give us clear minds and open hearts that we may witness to you in our world. Remind us to be who you would have us be, regardless of what we are doing or who we are with. Hold us to you and build our relationship with you and with those you have given us on earth. Holy Spirit, we invite you to work in our hearts. We thank you for your promise of forgiveness, that when we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. Thank you, Jesus, for what you have done for us. And we pray all these things in your name. Amen. Hi kids, I'm sorry I can't actually see your faces today, but that gives me a chance to show you something that might be a bit risky in church. It seems to me that sometimes we might hold back from doing the good things that God calls us to do because we're worried that we can only do small things uh, like give somebody a helping hand, a little bit of money, or maybe a loaf of bread. I want to remind you that God can take our little actions and turn them into something much bigger. I'm going to put a couple of drops of glycerin on this pile of crystals over here to show you something. Of course, the other thing that we have to remember is that our actions might not look immediately as if they're changing anything. God can use us, but sometimes we have to be a little patient just as we have to be a little bit patient with this over here. And we can wait and wait and then... In the same way that this fire started from a small action God can use small things to grow his kingdom. Matthew records Jesus telling the parable of the mustard seed. The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which is indeed the smallest of all the seeds. But when it is grown, it is greater than the herbs and becomes a tree, 
so that the birds of the air come and lodge in its branches. Let's pray. Father God, thank you that you call us to do good in the world. Please work in our hearts and show us what we need to do and take what we do and give and use those things to extend your kingdom and help those in need. Amen. Boys and girls, I knew I'd be in trouble with you if I didn't uh, give you at least one chance to see all the kittens. And as you can see, I've got all six of the little kittens in one box. And as you can well imagine, they eventually start getting a little bit cranky with each other and, and frustrated with each other. And I think that's a little bit how even families can get during lockdown. And so we wrote a new verse for Jesus Loves Me, which reminds us that Jesus helps us even when we're in a lockdown situation. And the, there's a word in, in verse 4 that you might not know. It's the word grouse. And the word grouse means to complain and to grumble and to get all cross and frustrated. And uh, our, our song says, Jesus loves me in my house even when I groan and grouse. And uh, it's a reminder that he'll look after us. So we're going to sing Jesus loves me the same as Jesus loves me the same for the Bible tells me so little ones to him belong they are weak and he is strong yes Jesus loves me yes Jesus We're going to look at the account of Jesus feeding the 5,000. And this miracle is recorded in all four Gospels. All four Gospels tell us that Jesus fed the 5,000. And each of the Gospels has some unique nuances. And then there are a number of things that all of the Gospels agree on. One of the things that they all agree on is that Jesus and his disciples were on retreat. The disciples had been out on their missionary journeys and they'd been proclaiming the good news of the kingdom to the various towns and villages and they'd come back to Jesus to debrief and they were meant to be on retreat, but the crowd found them. Mark tells us that Jesus had compassion on the crowd and that he saw them as sheep without a shepherd. Luke tells us that Jesus welcomed the crowd, that he acted like a host 
in receiving the crowd. John tells us that all of this happened when the Passover was nearby. Matthew, Mark and Luke record for us that Jesus says to the disciples, now you give them something to eat. And in John, Jesus asks Philip, where do you think we'll find bread for all of these? To which poor old Philip exclaims, it's going to take eight months wages. It's only John who tells us about the little boy who brings the five loaves and the two fish. But all four Gospels tell us that when Jesus had received the bread and the fish and had asked the crowd to sit down, that he gave thanks before he distributed the bread. Let's listen to the account of the Gospel story, the feeding of the 5,000, as Mike reads it for us from John. The reading is taken from John 6, verses 1 to 15. Jesus feeds the 5,000. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far side of the Sea of Galilee, that is, the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the miraculous signs he had performed on the sick. Then Jesus went up on the hillside and sat down with his disciples, the Jewish Passover feast was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming towards him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Eight months' wages would not buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up, here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish, but how far will they go among so many? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and the people sat down, about 5,000 of them. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled twelve baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. May God bless this reading to our hearts and understanding. Amen. How are you doing? Today is day 31 of lockdown. Can you imagine, can you believe that we've been under lockdown for over a month or a month? I imagine many of you have had to deal with either a full house or an empty house. Maybe you're desperate for some time alone, maybe desperate for some company. Maybe you've been bored, maybe you've been busier than you've ever been. But I think what many of us are feeling is a sense of tiredness. Many of us have looked at the statistics a little bit less, the news a little bit less, we're feeling worn out by the constant weight of the news of what's going on with the coronavirus and the decisions that our government is having to take. I think many of us are feeling nervous about what lies ahead. And the reality is that uh, all of this has just been preparation. Our battle with the coronavirus is far from over. In fact, this has just been the preparation and there is still a road ahead for us. I think the disciples had some similar feelings as they had sailed across the Sea of Galilee for a bit of time of retreat. They'd been out on their two by two missionary journeys. They had spread the news of the kingdom of God and now they were coming to be with Jesus to replenish. They were feeling stretched. They were drained. They were hoping for a chance to reconnect, to recalibrate. 
and to, to gain strength after a busy time. The bad news for them was just as they settled down in this quiet place that they'd gone to, there was a noise from just over the hill, a dust cloud, and then the crowd rushing towards them, busy, needy, clamoring, pushing past one another to get as close to Jesus as possible. And I imagine the disciples just sighing, saying, Oh no, oh no. But Jesus welcomes them. He welcomes them like a host, with compassion. He sees them like a shepherd sees his sheep, knowing that they need to be cared for, knowing that they've been without a shepherd for so long. And so he cares for the crowd. But even before the crowd arrives, he's already asked Philip, how are we going to feed them? And so the Synoptic Gospels record for us that by the end of the day, the disciples having had this question in the back of their hearts the whole day long, say to him, dismiss them, send them home so that they can get something to eat. And Jesus said, but I wanted you to feed them. I want you to feed them. Now John tells us that Jesus did this to test them. And this is not the kind of testing that is about passing or failing, but rather the kind of testing that is a refining, a molding, a a shaping. Jesus wants his disciples to have his heart. He wants his disciples to see the crowds the way that he does. But the disciples are human. And so they respond like we respond. Lord, there's just too many of them. And eight months wages would barely be enough to feed them. How can we possibly make a difference for such a big need. And that's the classic response, isn't it? That paralysis that overtakes us when we see a task too big. And while the disciples are wringing their hands and struggling with what needs to be done, Andrew notices a little boy who's been coming closer and closer. He's offering his lunchbox five barley loaves, and two small fish. And John emphasizes that the barley loaves are little, and the fish are little too. Barley loaves were the cheapest kind of bread that you could get, very much the food of poor people. And this little boy clearly is just coming with a meager lunch. But he sees the predicament, he sees that there's a need, and he realizes that he can do something. And maybe it's his youth, maybe it's his faith in Jesus, maybe it's just the generosity of his heart. But he doesn't let himself be paralyzed by the fact that his loaves are small and his fish are small. And even Andrew, who normally is able to bring people to Jesus, is struggling and he says, but how far can these loaves go? How far can these little fish go? But we know how the story ends. We know that Jesus gets the crowd to sit down to say grace. And then he feeds the crowd. The bread breaking over and over and over. The fish being broken into little pieces again and again and again. And before we know it, the entire crowd is fed. And the disciples, who had nothing at the beginning of all of this, now have more than what they started with. Because there's a basket for each of them. Twelve baskets full. Some commentators suggest that the twelve is also indicative of the twelve tribes of Israel, which are indicative of all the world. That what Jesus does is enough for everyone. This beautiful story really just tells itself, doesn't it? And we all put ourselves in the shoes of that little boy and ask ourselves, 
Would we be brave enough? Would we be open-hearted enough? Would we be imaginative enough to believe that the little that we bring could make a difference? And as the story tells us, it can and it will and it does. Not because of the little boy, but because of Jesus. You and I are a bit like the disciples. We're stretched. We're drained. We're hoping for lockdown to end and hoping for some replenishment. But the truth is, there is still so much need. There is still so much that will need to be done. We will still face the full battle that we have to have with the coronavirus and what it's going to do to our people, to our economy. And so like the disciples, we see the crowd coming over the horizon. And that crowd is the needs, it's the difficulties, it's the challenges. It's busy, it's needy, it's clamoring. And we might well feel like we want to run away. But Jesus asks us to handle the crowd. He asks us to step up. He asks us to do what we can do while he does what he does. And while he does what only he can do. We can't afford to be trapped into the scenario of, of hand-wringing and making excuses. We can't be paralyzed by the enormity of the need and the smallness of our resources. Instead, we simply need to keep our eyes open every single day for that one thing that we can do. And just imagine that. If in this next season, every one of us could just go through every day saying, Lord, is this my moment? Is this the moment where I put 20 rand in somebody's hand? And that's a loaf or a fish. Is this the moment where I spend some time encouraging somebody who's on the verge of giving up? Is this my moment where I take somebody's CV and pass it on to somebody else so that they might just get a job? Is this my moment where I in fact create a job for somebody else, even if it's just to wash my car and I can give them some money for that? You see, the next little while is calling on us to make a difference for those in need. During this week, I challenged you that when you went to do your shopping, you, put, you set aside a third of your trolley for buying many meal, canned goods and other essential items. And you put that into the basket in your supermarket. I know the spas are doing that. I think many of the others will do the same. But this is the season for us to give our loaves and our fish. This is the season where we give what we can and let God do what only He can with what we give. This is our time to step up. You might say, I can only sew 10 or 15 masks. But who knows what God could do with those masks that you make. It's our time. It's our talent. It's our treasure that we must make available to Jesus right now. But let's remember that it's not only physical needs that we must meet. There are emotional and spiritual needs that also need to be met. And Jesus shows us this in the second half of John chapter 6, when he speaks to the crowd, having put food in their tummies, he then speaks about being the bread of life. And our work is not only physical work. It's spiritual work too. We need to share our faith with those who need it. They might have enough physically, but they might need the hope of the gospel. They might need the courage that only Christ can give them. And we must offer it. I want to close with a picture that will be on your screens right now. 
This photograph is part of a series of photos called Journeys with the Messiah. They were arranged and taken by a world-renowned photographer named Michael Belk, who spent his life doing fashion photography for some of the most prestigious fashion and glamour magazines of the world. And at some point in his life, God challenged him and said, what are you going to do with the talent and ability that I've given you? And so Michael Belk set about this project in which he took a series of photographs in which he tried to translate the truths of a first century Jesus to a 21st century society. The photo that you're seeing now is the last in his series. It's Jesus working in a soup kitchen. But if you look carefully, there's a boy with five loaves and two fish in the background. But as you look more carefully at the photograph, those who are being helped and those who are doing the helping alongside with Jesus are all out of focus, just ever so slightly, all slightly blurry. It is only Jesus who is in crystal clear focus. And that's the way this needs to happen. As we make a difference in the world, as we bring our loaves and fish and let Jesus multiply them, let's make sure that it is him that is in focus and him that gets the glory. So today, you might find yourself in the crowd, rushing towards Jesus because you're in need. Maybe right now, you're facing physical need. Maybe your job is not secure. Maybe you're about to be retrenched. Maybe your finances are not with, uh, withstanding the hammering that our economy has taken. Maybe you're needy emotionally or spiritually. So you might be in the crowd. But Jesus has compassion on you. Today, you might be one of the disciples wanting to be obedient and, and God-honoring, but intimidated at the size of the challenge. Let's take comfort that Jesus is at the heart of the story. He has compassion on the crowds. He is a shepherd to them. And he will meet our needs as we put our trust in him. And if we're his disciples, let's learn from that little boy and give what we can and let him do what only he can do. Our prayer is going to be the hymn that is called the Hymn of St. Francis. It was also a hymn that was ascribed to be one of Mother Teresa's favorites. It's the prayer, make me a channel of your peace. Make me a channel of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me bring your love. Where there is hatred, be your pardon, Lord. And where there is hatred, let me bring your love. Oh, my God.
we can't hand out an offering bag today, we know that the offering is still an important part of the service. And so I want to ask you to quieten your hearts for a moment and pray this prayer with me. Just read this prayer out aloud with me. Dear Lord, you are the God of majesty and might. All we have is from you, and everything goes back to you. Please use us, our time, our talents, our treasure, for the glory of your name. Amen. Father in heaven, how easy it is to come at a time like this with feelings and hearts that are ungrateful. As we think of all the freedoms and the opportunities we've experienced in our lives that are now taken away from us, we so easily come before you with a sense of entitlement. And that fills us with ungratitude for that which we have. But the very fact that we can come this morning and bow our heads in safety, that we can pray to you, that we can join as a community, that we can even speak and hear your word, we know that we are blessed. You have given us food, you have given us shelter, and we can consider ourselves to be amongst those that are blessed. And so we give you thanks, Lord, for all that you've done all that you've given, all your love poured out on us. And Lord, it's at this time that we are so mindful of those a, who have less than us, but also all those, Lord, who have been serving us. And so, Lord, we wish to lift before you now all those that are serving in government, in leadership, for the difficult and the tough decisions that they have to make. We ask, Lord, that you would give them wisdom and guidance. We pray too, Lord, for those that are involved in the medical services, for doctors, for nurses, for those that are making all the necessary medicines. Mm -hmm. We pray, Lord, that you would watch over and you would keep them and that you would give them strength and courage. Lord, we thank you for the police force and the army and we ask, Lord, that you would keep them safe too. We pray, Lord, that the citizens would cooperate with the instructions. We pray, Lord, that you would watch over them and bless them, that you would keep them from harm. And Lord, we thank you for so many who serve us, those that are growing food, those that are processing food, those that are packing the food on the shelves, those who are busy wringing it up at the tills when we pay for it. We thank you, Lord. We ask that you would look after all these people who put themselves in harm's way so that we would be safe. We thank you for them. And we ask that you would watch over them. But Lord, we will also pray for all those people who are business owners and business leaders who find themselves in very difficult times trying to navigate these waters. Not sure which way to turn, not sure how to handle the situation, wondering where finance will come from. Who carry the load and the burden of their staff and their staff's families. Lord, would you give them wisdom? Would you make a way? Would you provide for them? And Lord, we ask that you would be with ourselves, be with homes, be with families, those who have jobs, unsurety and unsecurity, those who are not sure where food is going to come from, those who wonder what life will look like on the other end of this. We pray, Lord, that you would be with us all, that we would continue to keep our eyes fixed on you, that we would love you and that we would know you, and it would feel your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
the benediction. A few comments uh, about the way forward. Our president has made it clear that gatherings will not be permitted until we get to about level one of our post-lockdown phases and uh, so that means that we will not be able to gather together for worship just yet. We'll have to figure out the way forward and so in the meantime we'll continue doing services in this way and begin to explore ways in which we can be together in smaller groupings through our fellowship groups and those kinds of things. But I do want to encourage you to keep on joining us for services. We'll keep on doing services like this for a little while. And in particular, next week being the first Sunday in May, we'll have communion. And so please do get bread and grape juice and uh, be ready on Sunday morning and as part of the service. I'll lead us through communion. And so let's be strong and courageous as we go into this final week of lockdown and then into what lies ahead of us. And as we go, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us and remain with us now and forevermore. Our Steubens Valley United birthday is for this week. Today we wish a very happy birthday to Pete Theart and Michelle Carstens. We pray you have a very blessed day today. On Thursday, Emmanuel Dubé is having a birthday. On Friday the 1st is Margaret Dry. And then on Saturday the 2nd, Jessica Andre and Tando Lobisi. May God bless you on your special day this week. And here are the birthdays for Emmanuel and Grace. On Monday the 27th, Lorraine Hagemann, Bries von Black will be turning 16 and Bright Mashaya will be turning 10. On Tuesday the 28th, Cindy Bennett and Madison Prinsloo will be turning 9. On Wednesday the 29th, Ryan Boerter, Julian Hewitt, Jessica Hartley will be celebrating her first birthday. On the Thursday, the 30th, Adriana von den Berg and Marty O'Kelly will be turning 91. Congratulations. And Friday the 1st, Christopher Nell, Mizana Ngaza, Ina Hewitt, Leanne Parrott and Michael Kiriaku. And on Saturday the 2nd, Gavin von Black. 
Then anniversaries. On Sunday the 26th, Beverly and Des Mitchell will be married for 45 years. And then on Wednesday the 29th, Donna and Ryan Buerta, 16 years. Thursday the 30th, uh, Madeleine and Henry John Cock, 15 years. Kathy and Kevin Ormond, 32 years. And then the special one, Dorothy and Roy Nudia will be celebrating their 60th anniversary. Congratulations. Then on Friday the 1st, Heather and Alvain Peterson were married for 17 years and Sandra and David Conradi for 27 years. Congratulations to these people. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for special people in our lives and that we can celebrate special days with them. Bless these people celebrating their birthdays and anniversaries this week. Draw them close to you and hold your hand of protection over them. Amen.